Thank you so much, Tavis. What a treat to have you a part of the program and to introduce the great Dr. Cordell West. Sir. How you doing, my brother? Oh, what a blessing. What a How are blessing, you? Man. Oh, oh, I'm so blessed to be here. Listen, we... Be here. I don't leave wonderful people. This is so... Thank you for finally doing this. We've ten seasons, and here you are. I, I salute you. You are a magnificent oh. talent, and you got a high-quality team with Sister Tara, Sister Anna, Sister Hannah, Brother Eric, Sister Danielle. I could go on and on. I Brother can, Chris. Man, man, what is All going of y'all come together. Listen, the older you get, the, the more you remember. How's that? It's like working no, in the Sly Stone. It's a family affair, yeah. brother. No, it really is, and you know that. No, that's how absolutely. this works, right? Everybody working together. See, and Tavis, when we told yeah, Tavis for coming on, right? Kind, every, Tavis is kind. Don't you're up here, you're talking to kids, you're, and, and you've been doing that for a long time, talking to, to, to young and old alike, yeah. sharing your view of this world and where you think we can go together. Has that conversation changed over the years for you? No, it's the same thing. You know, issue of integrity, decency, honesty, virtue, how do you engage in quality service? You know, I'm a Christian, so it's to the least of these, the widow, the stranger, right. the elderly, the poor, working people, gay brothers, lesbian sisters. And I always begin on the chocolate side of town, you know. <laughs> uh, I begin with black folk and brown folk and red folk. Not because I don't love the vanilla brothers and sisters. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, uh, but I start with mom and dad. Right. I, I am who I am because somebody loved me. Right off the bat, you're talking about your faith and how strong it is to you. And then right there, pro-gay, pro-lesbian, which is, which has become another debate here about equality. Have yeah. you struggled with, with that, sharing that part of you? No, I don't struggle at all, because I mean, I try to tell the truth, bear witness, expose lies, and just willing to uh, sacrifice or live or die, whatever, whatever, whatever it takes to try to uh, live a short life. Because we're not in space and time that long, no, brother. That move from womb to tomb is a quick one. Yeah, if we're lucky. It's quick. Yeah. Each day is a gift. Every breath is a breakthrough. <laughs> but do you think, as you get older, do you think, oh, oh, it's coming? What, that, the, uh, the death itself? Yeah. yeah. Oh, shoot, I should have been dead a long time ago, man. <laughs> <laughs> All the mess I've been through, good God. You have had, it, you've had it quite a run. Oh, Lord. We're in death threats every day, every week. So, you know, it's, it, it's cool. Were you always cool with those things? No, I wasn't always cool with them. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it takes a little while to get used to it. When did it, it start? When did it start to. for you? When Race Matters came out. What, what, 19, what was it, 1993 or four? Because, you know, in the States, you know, we have a rich tradition. Uh, of a lot of things, a lot of good things, but we got, we got what, 1,100 white supremacist militia groups with many of our names on it. You don't have that in Canada. No. I know you got racism in Canada, but not like that. No. Good God, we had Jim Crow. We didn't have no Jim Crow in Canada the way we did. Do I understand the, the history properly that when you were around 12 years old, you wrote a book about Canada? How'd you know that? <laughs> That's what we do here. Nobody knows that you, book. A book about oh, me and mom. But like a 250-page book yeah, about I did, I did. <laughs> Why I Canada? Did. I was just curious, you know? Because I'm in California, and I wonder what's going on just south, north of the border. Right. You had seen and a picture? I fell in love with Canada. When I looked up. What did you keep? Reading about Nova Scotia and reading about the... I read about brother, a brother named uh, Henson, Josiah Henson. What a towering figure, you know? Born in Maryland, comes across the line, an underground railroad connected to Soldier of the Truth, and Harriet Tubman writes the autobiography that becomes the fugitive figure of George Harris in Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. You had towering figures, just like you got Austin, uh, Austin Clark, another towering figure in, in, in modern literature coming out of, on the chocolate side of Canada. Canada often likes to talk about how wonderful it's been with the Underground Railroad, but we have a real situation here with the way First Nations communities oh, have yes, been treated. I mean, and I know in America, yeah. similar challenges as Absolutely. well. It, so is, are there similarities? in the conversation from an African-American perspective? Oh, absolutely. Because, I mean, any time you have precious human beings of whatever color or sexual orientation or civilization who suffer, you need to focus on it. And our indigenous brothers and sisters too often are invisible in our public discourses. And I, I, I applaud you in terms of you not only raising these issues, but your struggles against hunger, struggles against poverty. Mm -hmm. That's not often the case with, with TV hosts. Most people who become celebrities tend to revel inside their celebrity hood rather than use it and deploy it 
for something bigger than them. And I love the way in which you use it, deploy it. Quickly, that's people got to realize that celebrity is just this hot light on you, and if you don't deflect it, it will burn you, and that's it. Ooh, I like that. that well, that's what it is. Deflect to places where... But that's what you do. Wow. Although you walk this neat line because you've become famous. And like, even this. So we played the Matrix clip, which I thought was amazing. Oh, yeah, but then there's a super you, hilarious moment from you in this TV show. Watch this. It's an honor to finally meet you, Questlove. Tracy, this is Dr. Cornell West. He teaches African-American studies at Princeton. Yeah, Brother Walter and Brother Warren and I were out seeing the five-year engagement last night. And they mentioned your concerns about the image you're presenting as a black man. Look, I don't want to make us look bad, but these dumb white writers don't know how us soul cats speak, one twixt the other. And they keep backing up this truck full of money for me to do this crap. I don't know what to do. Before you change the system, you got to change yourself, Brother Jordan. Who were your black role models growing up? Darth Vader, ninjas, some black licorice I tried to make into the shape of my dad. <laughs> <laughs> That's an amazing scene. That's an amazing scene. Ah, yeah, I, I haven't seen that. I haven't seen that in a good while, though, man. That's a funny yeah, moment yeah, to be yeah, part well, Tracy, Tracy's talented, brother. How do you do that? Because we do live in a culture where people, especially young generations, chase fame, and fame is the thing, and it yeah. can be very damaging if that's it. But you've kind of walked into that space where you're famous. Have you always mm. been comfortable with that part of it? You know, I never really thought about it that much. I mean, for me, it's just a spiritual issue. Now, I fall down on my face and try again, fail again, fail better, as Samuel Beckett used to say. Try again, fail again, fail better. And so you, you continually try to hold on to your integrity, decency, and honesty. But there's nothing that's explicitly political or ideological. It's just a moral and spiritual issue. This is the way you try to be in the world before the worms get you. Right. I want to come back and talk about your soul from oh, your yeah. perspective. More with Dr. Cornell West right after this. <laughs> All right, coming up, one thing Cornell said he'd have to know before he agreed to sign on to the Matrix. That's next. Come on in. We're back here with Dr. Cornell West. Love having Dr. in the red chair. Okay, so there's, there's so much stuff I want to talk about because your, your life has spanned so many things. We, we, right off the bat, we talked about spirituality and religion being so important to you. So, and I was raised by a very devout Christian woman, and here's mm. the challenge I've always had with with the mix. You are about, in a lot of ways, the, you have the pursuit of knowledge and the spreading of knowledge, and you are helping to take the scales off people's eyes and show them another world. But the whole point, the whole original sin, the whole idea is that you weren't supposed to eat from the apple from the tree of knowledge because it would show you too much. Mm. Self-awareness. Was, was it always a, like, are you a biblical Christian that can you follow the letter of the teachings? Well, I'm not a literalist in that sense, though. I mean, for me, it's fundamentally about love. Uh, and uh, any time human beings, we featherless, two-legged, linguistically conscious creatures born between urine and feces have the right to choose. You just made it sound so beautiful, though. <laughs> well, well we, we are a beautiful species in a certain sense if we don't destroy the whole planet, you know. What we're really talking about in terms of spiritual maturity, you're talking about humility, you're talking about vulnerability, and you're talking about tenacity. So you don't give up, you don't cave in, you don't sell out, but you continue to keep on pushing, as Curtis Mayfield put it. Right. And the other keep part of pushing. it, which I kind of like, is this also the idea of surrender. Yes, and that I think surrender is a really important part. That's true. It's very interesting you say that, though, because Wachowski's... And I, when we were down in Australia making the Matrix, we spent six or seven hours one night talking about the difference between surrender and resignation. Big difference, right? And there's a big difference. Speaking of the philosophy behind the Matrix, just watch this for one second. This is incredible. This is a critique of corporate capitalism on a global level, that forms of surveillance and repressive forces behind that surveillance and the individual seemingly dwarfed, seemingly rendered impotent and powerless, and yet still trying to see whether there's some possibility of heroic agency in such a corporate capitalist world. You do it a philosophical DVD commentary of the Matrix. Well, you gonna hunt that down too? That's yeah. amazing. <laughs> That's incredible. I must be in Canada. <laughs> 
God, in America, I never get this kind of a well, see, we figure that it, Watching the interviews you do in America, much of it is your opinion on current politics and, right, and, and, and not as much about this incredible story and life you've had and, and what's put you in a position to be this guy. That's what we find so interesting. But to break down the matrix and make it about something bigger, did you know that's what it was when you signed up to be in that movie? Oh, not at all. Not at all. Not at all. And I was just overjoyed when I found out what it was about. When I called, when I received a call, I was in New Mexico, and he said, well, we've written a character, Counselor West. Would you like to play yourself? I said, I only got one question. Does the character have dignity? <laughs> See, I didn't want to just act a fool. Right. I, mean, I don't mind being free and therefore acting uh, 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 being oneself. But I didn't want to act a fool because, you know, American television has so many black buffoons. Mm -hmm. I said, you got enough of them there, you know, especially ones who really do it well. And so I, I said, no, nah, I just want to have some dignity, you know what I mean? <laughs> they said, oh, no, this has dignity. The counselor has dignity. <laughs> I said, no, nah, I don't want to have so much dignity that I'm pure, because I'm not pure. Right. I'm funky. I'm a funk master. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 you keep it funky, but when you keep it real, keep it funky, it means right. you got the good and the bad. And that's in truth of all of us. We sure. got good and bad inter inter intertwined, you see? So how do you get the audience to want that kind of information? It's a matter of first you've got to intervene within the corporate media seducing so many persons because corporate me media constructs reality for so many people and therefore they're not exposed to what is being left out, what is hidden and concealed. And then when you do that, they have to see some courage in action because they don't feel as if they can make a difference. So it has to be mobilizing, has to be organizing. Snowden, and when they see that... Is Snowden an example of courage oh in action? Oh, my God, yes. He's the John Brown of our time. This brother, he can't even step foot in this country. Mm -hmm. And all he did was just expose lies and crimes. He was, oh, but no, he's, he, uh, he's, he's, he's uh, calling to question the security of the United States. Show us the evidence. White House, Congress, Pentagon, State Department. Not at all. He just exposed what they were trying to hide and conceal, especially linked to war, mm -hmm. and in some ways linked to, again, the new Jim Crow, the prison industrial complex. I've taught in prisons for 37 years. I'm teaching a course right now in Rawway Prison in, in New Jersey. One out of three young black brothers in America in many urban cities in prison on parole or on probation. So for me, that's a crime against humanity. Is our inmates different today than they were when you first went in there? Oh, Lord, yes. Yeah, what's the difference? <sighs> oh, Lord. Our precious young black and brown brothers, and you got some precious poor white ones too, but less so. Uh, their hearts are so hardened, and their conscience is so coarsened that they cold. And it takes a lot to try to warm them up. And really, their last form of transcendence is music. That's why I always start with the music. Mm -hmm. You start with little Donny Hathaway, Curtis Mayfield, you know, because music has become the last form of transcendence for them to get distance from their pain. They're not in church, mosque, synagogue, temple. They're not in social movements. They're not in civic institutions that provide some broader conception of public interest and common good. It's just survival of the slickest. Such a full life. So it was some years back when you get a diagnosis that you had stage four cancer, right? Is that, oh, yeah. That's, yeah. I mean, that's, that's the bad number, man. Yeah. Four's a bad number. No, no, it was in. They just gave me a couple of months. That's true. So what pops into your head in that moment? Well, you know, the first thing that hit me was I said to myself, I said, Lord, thank you for giving me 48 years at the banquet of life because I've had an overflowing number of blessings. And if it's time to go, it's time to go. A lot of, a lot of people making their entree. I got to make room. Mm -hmm. So you get that moment of thank you for the blessings. But Absolutely. Then it's There's not... no certainty at all. You know, and I don't even judge. I don't judge myself. I don't judge... Well, Hitler, I guess he's... <laughs> he's, a, he's a gangster, yeah. you know, Stalin or somebody. The book is in on them. Yeah. We know yeah. that. More, more with Dr. Cornell West right after this. <laughs> <laughs>
where does the first move lie? Who do you go to first? Well, I, mean, I go straight to the people themselves and say, just use your imagination and put yourself in the skin of other folk. If your child was being stopped and frisked the way it was in New York City, many of us went to jail, Brother Carl oh, Dixon and the others, uh, uh, put you, uh, allow yourself just to walk, not a mile, but a half a mile in their shoes. Because we would be out here, whether it's your child or whether it's our children, because it's a moral issue, you see. Now, if that doesn't work, of course, then you hit, hit, hit the streets, and that's exactly what we did. We hit the streets in Harlem. We had hundreds and hundreds of folk. We got arrested, and we went to jail, and we had a week-long um, trial, and we lost. But tremendous attention. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, now we got a mayor of New York City who at least wants to amend it. He doesn't want to end it. I think it ought to be ended, but at least he wants to amend it. But, and that's precisely what Phil Harper does. He's a brilliant young brother, the Dream Defenders, you know, down in uh, Florida. Brother uh, Barber, a magnificent um, uh, uh, freedom fighter in North Carolina. You got to bring people together. We have the same true with our Latino brothers and sisters in, uh, in regard to immigration. What is it, two million deported? And I'm gonna rapid fire some questions, kind sir. Are you ready for this? Yes, all right. Who's your, who's your favorite Republican? Favorite Republican? Mm -hmm. Boy, I gotta pray on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Good God Almighty, favorite Republican. <laughs> is that hard oh, I tell you who it is. It'd be my dear brother Robbie George. I teach with him at Princeton. He's yeah. a leading conservative Catholic intellectual. We've taught together for seven years. We've traveled all around the country together. I love the brother. He's just wrong <laughs> on, on a lot of things. You know? But he would he, be my favorite right he now. Would. Yeah. Let's say the man who controls Hollywood, we all know is Clint Eastwood. He calls you one day and he says, <laughs> and Clint says, Dr. West, I love your work. I will grant you one wish to be in any musical you want. Ooh, really? Yeah. And I can play any part? Any part, because you love musicals too. Oh, it'd be Stephen Sondheim, <laughs> the towering Sondheim himself. Nobody like him, inimitable. Which part would it be? Mm -hmm. Sunday in the Park with George, would it be? Do you sing? Company, you sing would it song. be? Well, oh, Barcelona, where you go in Barcelona? Oh, don't get up. Do you have to? <laughs> <laughs> He's, um, ah, that's the great song I have, I'm telling you. The one person you should apologize to. Hmm. That's a good question. God, I've already apologized to my ex-wives. How long did it take for you to apologize? Well, they had to apologize too. It was a mutual thing. <laughs> yeah. oh, no, no, oh no, it was, it was a mutual thing. Now. It was mutual understanding. Now. But uh, there is a sense in which you always kind of relive that, you know, because I mean, each one was just so magnificent, but I won't go into my life like that. I've been very blessed with magnificent women in my life. Uh, uh, and I tried to bless them, you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> one would hope. One would hope. <laughs> Oh, you funny, brother, I tell you. <laughs> you're not just brilliant, you funny, oh, too. You're a good man. What a real well, pleasure to see you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. What a blessing. Dr. Cornel West, everybody. What a blessing, my brother. Thank you. We'll be right back.